Good afternoon. Welcome to today's conference call. At this time, your lines have been placed on listen only for today's conference until the question and answer portion of our call, at which time you will be prompted to press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Please ensure that your line is unmuted and please record your name when prompted so that I may introduce you to ask your question. Our conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I will now turn conference over to our host, Ms. Helen Talley McRae. Ma'am, you may proceed. Hi, right, thank you, Jill. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Helen Talley McRae, and I work in the One Health Office of the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. On behalf of the One Health Office, I'm pleased to welcome you to the monthly Zoonoses and One Health Updates call. One moment. Sorry. Having a little technical difficulty, just one moment. Okay, um, before we get started, I want to remind everyone that the content of these calls is directed to veterinarians, physicians, epidemiologists, and related public health professionals in federal, state, and local positions. The CDC has no control over who participates in this conference call. Therefore, please exercise discretion on sensitive content and material as confidentiality during these calls cannot be guaranteed. Finally, today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. We're very pleased to announce that free continuing education, CE, is now available for Zohu calls. Detailed instructions are available on our website cdc.gov slash one health slash Zohu and will be given at the end of this call. Please spread the word to your colleagues about the Zohu call and this new free CE opportunity. In All right. In compliance with continuing education requirements, all presenters must disclose any financial or other associations with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters, as well as any use of unlabeled products or products under investigational use. CDC, our planners, presenters, and their spouses and partners wish to disclose they have no financial interests or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters. The planning committee reviewed content to ensure there is no bias. The presentations will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use. CDC did not accept any commercial support for this activity. Before we turn the call over to our speakers, we'd like to share some One Health updates with you. Laura? Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Laura Smith, Health Communications Specialist with CDC's One Health Office. First, I would like to welcome all of the new participants to today's Zohu call. Currently, we have over 1,700 subscribers representing public health and animal health officials, epidemiologists, veterinarians, physicians, nurses, and other public health practitioners at the federal, state, and local levels, as well as professionals from non-governmental organizations, industry, and academia. To begin today's call, I'd like to share the latest One Health news with you. These links were included in today's email reminder. If you didn't receive this email, please go to cdc.gov slash onehealth slash Zohu and click on the subscribe to get Zohu call emails link. This week is National Public Health Week and April 28th is World Veterinary Day. This month's vital signs report from CDC features dangerous antibiotic resistance threats, CDC has a summary of the March 2018 TAPFAR meeting online. CDC has launched NORS dashboard, an online tool that provides expanded access to outbreak data. And check out 2017 accomplishments from CDC's National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Diseases online as well. CDC's EIS conference will be held in Atlanta April 16th through the 19th. The National Association of Federal Vet Veterinarians will meet in Decatur, Georgia on May 12th. And the 5th International One Health Congress will be held in Saskatoon, Canada, June 22nd through the 25th. 
There are a number of recent publications related to One Health, including the April EID journal issue, which has an antibiotic resistance theme. And current outbreaks include salmonella infections linked to pet turtles and guinea pigs. And a selected list of ongoing and past U.S. outbreaks of zoonotic diseases is now available on the Healthy Pets, Healthy People website. If you would like for us to share news from your organization, suggest presentation topics, or volunteer to present, please contact us at zohucall at cdc.gov. Thank you for joining today's Zohu Call. I'll now turn the call back over to Helen. Thanks, Laura. We have three exciting presentation topics for you today. An update on ABMA activities on antimicrobial stewardship, Chagas disease ecology in the southern U.S., and animal and public health and agritourism. You'll find resources for each presentation online. Click on the link to April 2018 Zohu Call webpage in today's email. Questions for any presenter may be typed into the chat box in Adobe Connect. If you're using a phone line, press star 1 and give the operator your name and affiliation. We will have time for questions and answers at the end of the call. You'll see uh, the, the learning objectives here on the presentation. They're, these are the um, for continuing education learning objectives overall for the for this call. Okay. And our first presentation this afternoon will be given by Dr. Virginia Fate. Dr. Fate, you may begin when you're ready. Thank you, Helen. Um, and thanks for inviting me to participate in this call. Um, I spoke to, on this call several months ago um, to, to tell everyone about what the AVMA was doing um, about antimicrobial stewardship, um, particularly in relation to companion animal um, stewardship. But um, we were, we're ready to provide some more information about what AVMA has been doing, and so um, that's why I'm participating today. Um, so I'm just going to update you on some of the activities that AVMA, the American Veterinary Medical Association, has been doing as it relates to antimicrobial stewardship in, um, vet, in the veterinary profession. So um, I think it's a, we would all agree that, that stewardship of antibiotics is in the best interest of animal health and welfare and certainly of public health. Um, and so a couple of years ago, the AVMA um, consolidated essentially all of the um, uh, efforts related to antimicrobials um, into um, one section of the organization and developed this new committee, the Committee of Antimicrobials, um, in order to focus some of the expertise and resources and make it easier to, um, to, to handle some of the issues related to antibiotics. Um, and so this committee is made up of nine members of um, specific species-specific um, veterinary organizations and then alternate delegates as well. Um, and so they represent a breadth of um, veterinary practice um, to provide input and perspective on um, multiple issues. And so I'm, I'm just reiterating what the charge of this committee is and um, <clears throat> the important there are many important roles, but one is certainly to promote the AVMA um, as the leader and trusted source of information on antibiotic use in animals, um, and as a primary collaborator in a One Health approach to um, dealing with the issue of antimicrobial resistance. And so um, as a committee, we're interested in building consensus, providing leadership on the topic, um, being a resource helping support veterinarians in their oversight of um, antimicrobial use and to promote stewardship. And so one of the first things we worked on um, as a committee was to develop a strategy as it relates to antimicrobials. And so this was um, um, finalized last year and with the vision being that veterinarians are trusted leaders and stewards in preserving the effectiveness of antimicrobials. There are three major strategy um, goals, but the second one is the one that's relevant to the discussion today, and that is um, that AVMA promotes antimicrobial stewardship through the use of or the development of core principles to support allied organizations in their development of species-specific stewardship or clinical guidance. We recognize that not all practices are the same, not all species are the same, 
Um, not all clients are the same, and so we wanted to develop some overarching principles, and that's um, also what I'm going to present today. So the uh, common definition for antimicrobial stewardship for the profession, for the veterinary profession, and then some um, overarching principles um, to help apply um, stewardship in practice. So um, this was um, unanimously approved by the ADMA's House of Delegates, which is the representative body for the organization, um, representing all of the states as well as all of the allied veterinary association. And it was um, this definition and then the principles that I'm going to present to you were um, unanimously approved. So we're pretty excited about getting a um, buy-in from the entire profession and organization. And so this is the, um, our definition of um, stewardship as it relates to veterinary practice. And most of the definitions you'll find about stewardship are fairly similar, um, but we wanted to highlight a few things. So antimicrobial stewardship refers to the actions veterinarians take individually and as a profession to preserve the effectiveness and availability of antimicrobial drugs through conscientious oversight and responsible medical decision making while safeguarding animal, public, and environmental health. So you can see the One Health um, aspect of this is, is highlighted in this, um, this overarching definition. And it um, talks about that stewardship is about action. It's about doing something. Um, it's not just about um, thinking about what a great idea it is. And so the core principles that underlie that um, or that would allow for the application of that definition, um, the, they all relate to maintaining animal health and welfare, using an evidence-based approach when making decisions to use antimicrobial drugs, and then using them judiciously, and with continual evaluation of the outcomes of therapy. And so there are some things in this, um, in the core principle introduction here that are a little bit different than previous discussions about um, judicious use of antimicrobials we're actually taking a step back from that and talking about um, the main, maintaining animal health and welfare using preventative and ma management strategies, um, and then making explicit decisions as to when or when not to use antimicrobials. Then obviously we, um, we think using them judiciously is important. But then the follow-up, which is um, evaluating the outcome of therapy in individual patients and um, groups of patients, and I'll, I'll touch on that again in a minute. So the major core principles, and I have a number of these in the slide, so I'm just going to say this. So the first one um, core principle is to commit to stewardship. And let me also say um, that we use the um, framework that the CDC um, published first, the um, stewardship um, principles for um, hospital antimicrobial stewardship as well as outpatient. And the outpatient um, antimicrobial stewardship principles that the CDC has published are um, a bit more relevant to uh, most veterinary practices. And so, but we use both of those as a framework for um, coming up with principles relevant to veterinary practice. So the first is, the, is commitment to stewardship engaging everyone that's involved in making decisions about and then administering, using, and evaluating antimicrobial use. Um, the idea that you actually have to have a stewardship plan um, to make it truly um, stewardship. Identifying high priority conditions that would be a good, that would be targets for um, considering um, whether antimicrobials are being used appropriately. Um, systematically committing to evaluating outcomes, and then identifying um, one or more leaders to, um, to lead the charge on stewardship within your practice setting. The second core principle has to do with prevention um, and at a higher level than that. So advocating for a system of care, we felt like this phrase applied to um, whatever practice setting you might be in. Um, and looking for how, how can you identify barriers um, to disease prevention and how can those be improved, um, preventative and various preventative and management strategies that would reduce the need for antimicrobial drugs in the first place, um, and then consider alternatives if they happen to exist. 
And then um, there's been a lot of, um, historically, we've talked a lot about using drugs, um, antimicrobial drugs judiciously, and um, that's certainly one of the principles of, um, core principles of stewardship. And then this evaluation of drug use practices, this is at the individual veterinarian level, perhaps at the practice level, maybe in the, even at a higher level than that, more aggregated level than that, but the idea is to provide feedback on outcomes and um, types of use, drugs that are being used, what conditions are being seen, and so on. We don't have um, uh, we don't have an idea exactly how this might work, and um, and some of our uh, members are looking at ways to provide some checklists and things like that that would be helpful um, in in evaluating. We we also want to engage clients in um, in the whole stewardship process and thinking about using antimicrobials. Um, the um, the next um, and really the last um, core principle is about expertise and education. Um, this is continuing education, but it also includes um, critically appraising and appropriately um, applying any existing guidelines that currently um, are available for antimicrobial use for specific conditions, um, providing client education, and so on. So those are the five major core principles related to um, antimicrobial steward, stewardship for the veterinary profession. And then at the end of this core principle document, we urge veterinarians to take action, to actually implement one or more of these principles, um, that, it, that this is not just something that we think about. This is something that, that requires action on the part of veterinarians. So then some of the things that the committee is now um, working on next we're developing some resources for um, individual veterinarians to actually implement things in, within their practice, um, like I mentioned, the checklists and things like that. Um, we're working on the um, companion animal side to begin with. The ADMA website is being, um, that portion of the website related to antibiotics is, is being redesigned, so there'll be a single sort of resource um, landing page where you'll be able to find um, all, of, all of our information and content about antimicrobials and antimicrobial resistance. Um, we are looking at ways to collaborate with others, um, such as the AAVMC, the um, educational accrediting body, um, and other educational groups to see about um, how do we um, spread the word and educate about these um, principles and about stewardship, and then Similar to this call, are there other ways that we can engage with um, some others in the One Health arena as it relates to um, reducing and combating antimicrobial resistance? So that's um, all I have, and I guess we're going to take questions at the end, right? Exactly. Yep. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Fate. Our next presentation this afternoon will be given by Dr. Sarah Hamer. Dr. Hamer, you may begin when you're ready. Thank you. I'd uh, like to thank you for the opportunity, Helen, to present today and to everyone online for listening. And I've been fortunate to work with a group from Texas A&M University for the past five or so years to explore Chagas disease, ecology, and epidemiology. And today I'll share with you some of our research highlights from the past years. To start um, with the basics, Chagas disease is caused by a protozoan parasite, Trypanosoma cruzi, and it's estimated to impact six million people worldwide. And you can see from the distribution map of valleys that most impacted people are in um, South America, Central America and Mexico, but in fact we do have a number of infected persons in the United States, most of which are immigrants from endemic regions, but there's a small and growing number of locally acquired infections from the United States as well. This is a vector-borne protozoan parasite, and it's transmitted in the infectious species of triatamines or kissing bugs, and this parasite is capable of infecting hundreds of mammalian species, so it's a generalist. Trypanosoma cruzi's life cycle is shown here on this image, where if you start at the left, you can see a, a kissing bug that's taking a blood meal. And if this blood meal is from an infectious host, then it can ingest the uh, blood form of the parasite, which will undergo some changes within the vector's body. 
And then the infectious stage of the parasite is excreted with the bug's fecal material. If this infectious fecal material then gains entry to a new host, perhaps through the bite wound or a nearby mucous membrane, then infection can occur. There are additional routes of transmission that are listed at the bottom of the slide. And I just want to point out that ingestion of infected vectors we think is a very important mechanism of transmission, especially with respect to dogs. Here in the southern United States, I'll, I'll present a little bit uh, more later, but we think a lot of dogs are becoming infected by eating uh, kissing bugs from the environment. In terms of the disease manifestations in hosts, in humans and animals, many infected hosts may remain asymptomatic, but a percentage of infected hosts will develop a chronic disease after a period of perhaps several years or even decades of indeterminate infection. And in chronic disease, there can be a number of different ways uh, the disease manifests. And with, um, I'll focus here on cardiac disease, depending on where the parasite localizes in the heart, there can be arrhythmias, myocarditis, dilation of the heart, heart failure leading to death. And that image on the slide here just shows a, a pseudocyst of the amastigote stage of the parasites, the intracellular stage um, within a cardiac myocyte. There are several different uh, genetic strains of the parasite. We refer to them as TC1 through TC6, and there's also a bat-associated strain. And they have different geographic distributions, different host associations, and potentially different disease manifestations are associated with these different strains. So it makes a lot of sense that when we're studying the ecology of this parasite, we try to type the parasite and learn about what strains are circulating in what hosts and vectors. I wanted to make the point here that this parasite in the United States is certainly not new. There are records of infected triatamines going back to 1916. Um, reports of infected wildlife followed soon after. In fact, the first human case of Chagas disease and canine case of Chagas disease in the United States were reported right here from Texas. Um, there's been a limited number of typing of the parasite from human infections in the U.S., but those locally acquired human infections in the U.S. have typed to strain TC1. Um, and I'll mention there that bottom map, every red dot is a positive uh, blood donor in the United States that has screened positive, and you can see there's thousands of dots there. But important to recognize that this doesn't reflect local transmission from established kissing bugs for the most part. Um, many of these individuals would have acquired their infections elsewhere. Um, and the bottom bullet point here is that although I've mentioned this disease is a concern for humans and a concern for dogs, we also have a number of research projects underway at a few different um, non-human primate biomedical research facilities that are in the southern United States that coincide with regions where triadamine vectors occur. And these animals are housed in semi-outdoor facilities, and they have access to bugs. And unfortunately, many of them are becoming infected. And this limits the degree to which these non-human primates can be used for research purposes. So a brief snapshot, and this is some uh, artwork from my student Carolyn Hodo. In the United States, we think we have robust sylvatic transmission of trypanosoma cruzi, meaning wildlife and vector-associated transmission. And some of the key wildlife reservoirs that have been identified include um, raccoons and armadillos, wood rats, possums, skunks, uh, to a lesser extent bats, um, and other rodents. And occasionally, vectors will feed on these sylvatic reservoirs and then bridge the parasite into uh, peridomestic transmission, um, disperse into uh, households or the peridomestic environment and bring the parasite with it. And then, of course, depicted here also are these non-human primate facilities, which sort of serve as an intermediate um, in the transmission cycle. But I wanted to... Um, so this picture here, you might be familiar with um, scenarios like this from reading textbooks or when you think about Chagas disease, we think about in rural areas of South America where the vectors are infesting human dwellings associated with mud walls and thatch roof. And certainly that, um, those transmission scenarios might account for a large burden of human Chagas disease in those regions, but that's not the situation that we have here in the United States where domestic infestations appear to be, you know, fortunately quite rare. We have, however, recovered kissing bugs from very well-manicured houses, including the one that's shown here on the top picture. 
Um, and largely they're individual adult bugs that are likely dispersing and drawn to the human dwellings from mites. And it's different than uh, an established um, breeding population of vectors. Shown on the bottom there are some pictures of dog kennel environments, which also seem to be a hot spot for kissing bugs um, in some of the regions we're studying in Texas. And a brief glimpse here at the data put together by the Texas Department of State Health Services. Um, in Texas, Chagas disease is reportable in humans, and for a small number of years, veterinary cases were also reportable. And you can see any county that has some color or some cross-hatching is a county where vectors or positive animals or positive humans have been identified. And canine Chagas disease is certainly an issue. We have a lot of good data coming out of Texas where we're studying different dog populations. Not only is this infection being diagnosed in what we would think of as high-risk dogs, you know, those stray dogs on the streets or the Border Patrol working dogs that have high elements of vector exposure, um, but also household pets. And, um, and we're able to, through our proximity to the vet school here, um, track a number of um, canine cases over time. So because there are no vaccines available and there are limited options for treatment, um, we're interested in breaking the transmission cycle, whether that's breaking transmission from um, vectors to hosts or breaking the degree to which vectors can be infected with the parasite. And very briefly, at a and and through collaborators at the State Health Department and with the CDC and other universities, we have a number of research lines dealing with dogs, wildlife reservoirs, non-human primates, human research down along the U.S.-Mexico border. But what I wanted to focus on is just um, a, a little bit of a development of our work with the triadamine vectors over the past five years. We wanted to study these vectors over space and over time and their infection prevalence but found these traditional techniques to collect the vectors are labor intensive and we'd often come, come back with very few insects. This includes manual searches, uh, digging up um, wood rat middens underneath cactus thickets, and um, using dry ice and, and other techniques. But when we were out on private ranches and in other areas, we could talk to landowners. Many of them were familiar with kissing bugs and had seen them. So we developed some outreach materials, and this slowly transitioned into our citizens a website developed where people can come and learn about the vectors, learn about the disease, learn about the parasite, and upload pictures of bugs that they've encountered for our team to identify. And then if this is a kissing bug that we're interested in, we can solicit those individuals to mail the bug, the dead bug, to our lab where we can test it for infection and report those results back to the submitter. Um, we do divert bugs that are known to have fed on humans to the state health department um, of the state that they have been collected in. And this slide here just shows our uh, fairly new app for smartphones for uploading pictures. And the great thing here is that they come with a location stamp and a timestamp, so we get lots of good information. And we're trying to develop some other outreach materials like these resin cast kissing bugs and also look-alike species that are safe to handle so that we can use them and teach people about the size of these insects and what they look like. Through this program, we realize there's a lot of look-alike species that cause a lot of needless concern among the public. And it's um, especially true if there's a big news story about Chagas disease and then they show a big picture of a leaf-footed bug or a wheel bug or um, an insect that might look similar but does not transmit this parasite. Um, we get a lot of activity through our citizen science program of people who have concern for a common garden insect, for example. Once we receive kissing bugs, they enter our processing pipeline. And usually we're interested in what species is it, what, uh, where was it collected, what was it doing, is it infected with Trypanosoma cruzi? If so, what strain of the parasite? And then we also can use some molecular approaches to figure out what was that bug feeding on, wildlife, human, dog, a combination of the above. And then very briefly, just with a snapshot of our program over the past years, we're now up to about 4,500 insects submitted by, uh, kissing bugs submitted by citizen scientists. Most of them come from Texas because that's where our outreach efforts are. Um, and you can see any state there on that map with cross-hatching is a state from which we've received kissing bug specimens. So lots of representation over the region um, where these bugs have been reported. Several different species have been collected. If we look at where these bugs came from, most of them are coming from 
the outdoor environment, in particular dog kennels or immediately outside the home. However, about 26% of the insects we receive do come from inside homes. And their activity periods are pretty neat to explore. Largely, the species that we're dealing with, especially here in Texas, are active in the summer and early fall months, but there's variation among species. And this is important to keep this phenology in mind when we think about timing outreach messages um, to the public. It makes sense to do so at the start of the summer season and not in the middle of the winter when people are more likely to be vigilant and come up with other insects that are not kissing bugs and become concerned about them. And then finally, about 55% of the adults that we've received are infected with the parasite. We find mostly strains TC1 and TC4. Nearly an equal mixture of those two strains seem to be circulating among the vectors that are part of this collection. And they feed on diverse hosts, including dogs, humans, and a number of wildlife species. And on this pie chart, you can also see monkeys and tigers, and these represent bugs that were collected from a local zoo in Texas. And these observations actually make sense given the hosts that were available to the bugs. So I have two slides left. I just wanted to wrap up by sharing two research directions that are on the horizon for us. The first is that we've been working with a scent detection canine. This is Ziza. She's a German short hair pointer, and she was retired from the TSA. She's a government working dog, but she's positive for Chagas disease, and so she was retired early. She was trained on scent detection of 10 different black powders, and now through her trainer, we were able to kind of convert her training over, and she can detect kissing bugs in the environment. And with some pilot work um, that involved um, individuals across um, military public health, Texas State Health Department, she was able to detect um, several uh, clusters of nymphs in the environment. And so we look forward to working with her this summer. And then finally, through the collaboration with the CDC, we now have thriving colonies of triatamines in the quarantine facility here on campus. And we're doing some different behavioral and uh, transmission experiments that are going to open some new doors for us. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Hamer. Uh, just a reminder to everybody who um, is on the call that you may type questions <coughs> for any of our presenters <coughs> Excuse me, into the Q&A box on Adobe Connect or press 1 at any time and, um, on your phone and give the operator your name and affiliation. Here our final presentation this afternoon will be from Dr. Valerie Koenig. Dr. Koenig, you may begin when you're ready. Okay, great. Thank you, Helen. So today I'm going to be talking to you folks about a project that I've been working on, and I want to thank you so much to the Zohu Call coordinators for um, inviting me to speak on this topic today, as it's really exciting. Um, primarily working on animal and public health in agritourism and developing an education initiative. So just to give you a little bit of project background, I apologize. Um, seems like some things are overlapping here. Um, the agritourism industry, in terms of this sector as part of agriculture, has really been rapidly expanding throughout the country, but especially here in New England, as it's something that the smaller farms here in New England have found a great way to kind of market themselves to consumers when it comes to local products, and it's allowed them to make um, more profit than they would have otherwise as well. So it's kind of a mutual benefit um, situation with agritourism operations here. Unfortunately, there's also a variety of risks involved with agritourism, as we're well aware. And that was highlighted here locally by an E. coli 015787 outbreak on a Connecticut goat dairy back in the spring of 2016. Um, there was 50 confirmed cases, and unfortunately, this farm ended up going out of business because of this incident. So as kind of a follow-up from that, the Connecticut Department of Ag, along with their, um, their state public health as well as federal CDC, um, USDA, even extension agency and insurance agencies, um, hosted a single educational workshop that summer. It was a well-attended event due to it being a recent incident, um, but it kind of got me thinking about kind of what we needed to continue doing. Um, it really just was not a one-and-done sort of educational event. It was a real need for an ongoing educational initiative, not just for Connecticut, but for all of New England. And even though us as veterinary services under the USDA have no pertinent regulations specific to agritourism, we definitely could function to be a, as a coordinating agency to compile tools and education and bring those experts to the table as well as leveraging our own expertise on animal health and zoonoses, especially as an agency we've been getting more involved in these One Health discussions, especially when it comes to zoonotic diseases pertaining to livestock. 
And in my research, I found a lot of great resources out there with good information and a wide variety of information. But there was a couple of improvements that I felt that were needed, one of which was ease of reference, so the ability for the average farmer, fair operator, whoever, um, to be able to find what they needed, as well as to be able to understand the information, as in some cases is um, a little bit more scientific than the average person might understand. And then lastly, the ability to find all components in one place was something that was just kind of um, something I couldn't find consistently. So that then developed into project objectives for the sake of a uh, grant proposal, the first of which was to develop a balanced integrated One Health toolkit or contribute to an existing one for farmers on best management practices to mitigate the public health and safety risks related to agritourism. Secondly, to function as that leveraging agency amongst federal, state, and extension agencies to promote that here in New England. And then lastly, to host two training workshops for farmers, fair operators, and farm service professionals, not only about the risks, but give them tools to mitigate those risks. So because there was an existing toolkit that did have a good amount of that information already put together, I wanted to focus my project content specifically on the animal risks as they related to public health. So to develop a module that looked at those components. And basically the way that I wanted to set it up was integrating that knowledge that the farmers already have about animal disease and putting that together with public health awareness, as they know a lot more than they think they do, it's just a matter of putting those concepts together. So what I wanted to do is create this pathogen-based education that looked at some of these components listed here, such as bacteria, parasites, and viruses, looking at pathogens they're familiar with and then relating it to the public health side of things. One of the important points I wanted to make, the reason why I have it listed as both enteric and non-enteric bacteria, is because most of the time people think about manure contamination being the primary issue. But unfortunately, there's other pathogens that are non-enteric, such as, for example, reproductive pathogens like Q fever that present a definite public health concern. So it's something that was important to discuss. The other thing was about exposure risk awareness. How do people that come to visit the farm get exposed to these pathogens? And that raising awareness amongst farmers, how that happens was really important because it's not just through direct contact. And then also to have that discussion of disinfectants and hand washing, how do you select a disinfectant? How do you use it appropriately, as well as the inevitable discussion of hand sanitizer and soap versus soap and running water and how hand sanitizer really just doesn't cut it in the majority of situations. The last part of that content, I wanted to be these practical steps to minimize risk. As the compendium for animals in public setting has great recommendations on things like facility layout as shown here in this picture, um, as well as best practices, ultimately when it comes to the New England farms, a lot of farms don't have a lot of money to implement all of those best practices. So it's a matter of practical steps that they could take considering cost as well as effectiveness of those um, practices that they could implement. So the project has ran from April through September um, of 2017 based on the funding cycle. And the involvement of the state ag and public health was really crucial from day one. Um, they helped to identify the priorities and they were the main driver of the education delivered as part of this training. The, second, the next step was developing the training module and then conducting the workshop training. So just to give a little bit of details of the workshop itself, this is a snapshot of the agenda um, that we used for the workshop with the title, Is the Public Really Safe on Your Farm? Learning the Keys to Success in Agritourism. And then including all the state um, Department of Ag logos on here to really show that this is a collaborative educational effort. The workshops were held in August of 2017. And the topics included that animal and public health module I previously mentioned, um, topic of biosecurity, overall farm safety, state regulations, we actually had a state representative from each of the states talk about um, their pertinent regulations to agritourism operations, discussion about liability, as well as engaging the public, which is a really interesting topic. And it was basically kind of a psychology 101 of sorts for farmers um, and fair operators to understand how the public is motivated to do certain things and how to better motivate them to actually follow the procedures when they're visiting a farm. The other part of this was providing the attendees with printed toolkit and outdoor signage. So the toolkit actually consisted of fact sheets as shown here for the Center for Food Security and Public Health from Iowa State about the diseases that we talked about in the module, as well as checklists to help folks to go home and assess their own operation and prioritize risks and be able to figure out what was the best to address um, considering costs and priorities of overall risk mitigation. The signage that I printed was on corrugated plastic, so available to be outdoors. And there was two primary sets of signs that I printed, a couple examples shown here, um, the white ones from UVM Extension and the colored ones being from North Carolina State. And basically the big thing was, is I wanted signs that were going to be visible, easy to read and understand, and something that was going to be eye-catching for people to actually pay attention to. So overall, there was decent turnout considering the summer timeframe. 
And the overall feedback was really positive on the knowledge gain and the usefulness of information, especially when it came to local public health officials, and I'll talk a little bit more about that a little later. The signs were a huge deliverable for this project. Um, a lot of farms just don't have a lot of money to spend on certain things. They would love to have signs, but in terms of actually printing them on their own, this allowed them to be able to just take the signs home and find the right place to put them. There's been a variety of follow-up activities from these workshops, such as providing resources and support, as well as presentations that, um, for groups that want to kind of continue this discussion. So there was many lessons learned as part of this project, um, but the collaboration was really the big key one, and so I'm going to focus on that here for the sake of the time of this presentation. The input from our Department of Ag partners, so our state animal health officials and public health officials from those states, was really, really awesome, and it was one of those things that really helped to direct the change they wanted to see, as ultimately they're going to be the ones responding to the initial disease incident on some of these farms if there was to be something, and so these preventative measures to put into place was obviously something that was going to benefit them greatly as well. They really valued that direct producer interaction from the workshop, as well as the interagency crosstalk really brought about a more unified message, which was really important um, for the farmers and fair operators to see. In terms of other USDA agencies, some of the examples of some that we had involved in this process shown here, their staff has more boots on the ground activities than we do in terms of getting out onto farms and assessing operations. And so the importance of their partnership to deliver needed resources to farmers was really highlighted by this experience and something we're continuing to delve into, especially because this also brought about the environmental component to the One Health Outreach. So here we covered the animal and the public health components but the environmental components, such as through programs that NRCS has, like soil management and manure management, those are really important things that can also affect animal health and public health, so we're continuing to um, look into that. Extension agencies were another great partner on this. They've got a lot of similar ideas and related activities, and they ultimately have more localized farmer interaction and better understanding of needs on a local level. So we were able to help them with some resources, but they also helped us a lot when it came to speakers and experts um, for some of our training workshops and our materials as well. Public health, of course, is really crucial. Um, CDC's partnership in this was really key. Um, we were fortunate to have a speaker from the CDC come to one of our workshops, and I think it really demonstrated to folks here on the local level that it's not just state and local folks that are really you know, invested in seeing these farms succeed, but also from the federal level, and I think that was a really important thing. As I alluded to earlier, the workshop feedback also demonstrated a need to communicate more with the local public health partners. There was these knowledge gaps about farming and agritourism best practices recommendations, something that we could really kind of plug into more and provide potentially some education for that. And so what that's led into is this project follow-up, um, specifically when it comes to the local public health outreach and education component, looking at food service safety and how to actually figure out, you know, in terms of animal contact when it's allowed and food service that's happening, what's going on in between, not just proximity, for example, of those two, are there barriers and hand washing stations in between and being able to assess an operation based on some of those types of principles. There's a really great desire to work together as we have a lot of common goals and so that's something that's been really exciting to plug into. Also, we've got national commodity studies as part of the National Animal Health Monitoring System um, and the GOAT study that's happening next year is actually adding an agritourism questionnaire for the first time. They want to gain knowledge on the practices followed for, from a more national level as there's these great best practice recommendations that are out there, but how many people are actually following them and how are they implementing these practices. So that's been kind of an exciting thing. I've been helping to revise and pre-test that questionnaire, so hopefully we'll get some great information out of that questionnaire when it happens next year. So overall, this project really showed that agritourism education is not only necessary and desired, but that it's possible. And that through one type of initiative, we could really benefit a wide variety of people from farmers, to ag and public health agencies and the public alike, which was really kind of exciting. Collaboration really cannot be understated. Um, it was really important to involve all the necessary players uh, from the get-go, really give them a seat at the table to be able to discuss their concerns and be able to figure out how to best address those um, through one type of initiative. And we may think that it's hard because we've got a lot of different goals amongst a variety of different agencies and groups, but we've got a lot more in common than you think, um, not just with our goals, but also struggles. Um, so something that we can talk a lot more about that when we're actually all together and being able to share those discussions. Lastly, this project, I think, really demonstrated that One Health can be a real and tangible effort. I think One Health as a concept has been something that's been talked about for a long time and something that can be really challenging to, to truly implement in a real and practical sense. And I think this project um, did just that and did so 
well, and it's exciting to see how this discussion has really started a lot of other um, follow-up paths from this, and um, hopefully this will continue to be something that we can talk and engage more in. So that is it for mine. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Koenig. Um, so at this time, we're, we'd like to take questions uh, for any of the presenters. Uh, we don't have any questions uh, showing up in, on Adobe Connect, so um, we're going to uh, see if we have any calls, uh, any questions on the phone line. Um, if you're using a phone line, press star 1 and give the operator, Jill, your name and affiliation. Jill, do we have any questions so far? No, we do not, ma'am. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully we'll have some in a few minutes. I know it's spring break for a lot of folks, so... Yeah, we just want to thank um, all of you again for those um, presentations. They're very interesting. It's good to get the um, follow-up on the uh, antibiotic stewardship. And as Laura mentioned, um, the uh, CDC vital signs uh, that was put online yesterday has a lot of uh, new information related to that as well. Hey, Jill, any questions so far? We do have two that came in. Our first one's from Megan Nichols. Your line is open, ma'am. Hi, this question is for Valerie. Valerie, I um, really appreciated the work that you highlighted here in One Health, and I was wondering if you might talk a little bit about um, where the workshop was located and how that really was, seemed to be very conducive to producer attendance. I thought that that was really quite impressive. Yeah, no, thank you, Megan, and thank you for coming up and being part of that whole process. The two workshops that we did, one was for northern New England, so that included Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, and then the second was southern New England, um, which was considering, that was Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. And considering the time of year, that obviously made it kind of tricky in terms of agritourism being really up and running by August um, during the summer, but we had a nice central location, and I think what was something that was really important as part of that, too, is we actually had it um, at a public library, which really made it, I think, a lot more approachable. I think a lot of times when it comes to farmers and fair operators, when you have all of these kind of government and other organization personnel, sometimes it can seem a little intimidating. And I think the way that we had it set up, and even though we had all of those folks there, we also had a great discussion that I think was really a candid discussion, especially at the end of the workshop, about their concerns. And I think it provided a great forum for people to be able to really talk through kind of what their concerns were from their own operation and their own personal level um, and really helped us to have that shared ideas and conversation to really help people figure out how they could best um, operate under their own circumstances. Great. So, Joe, we have another question on the phone? Yes, we have one from Linda Thompson with Cornell University. Your line is open. Hi there. My question is for Dr. Hamer. Um, I'm wondering if the molecular tests that you're using to test the kissing bugs to see if they're infected with the Trypanosoma cruzi are available to test clinical suspect animal samples. We've had trouble finding anybody who, who could do a PCR you know, on a routine fee-for-service basis on suspect cases. Hi, thank you for the question. Yes, we're using a series of different um, PCR techniques to detect uh, DNA from different genetic regions of Trypanosoma cruzi in the vectors, as well as in dogs and wildlife and, and various tissue samples. Um, for research purposes, you know, we're always interested in growing and collaborating and have some, you know, permits underway to receive samples from other institutions. In terms of fee-for-service labs, I'm aware of one, maybe two uh, uh, veterinary labs that provide PCR testing, I think on canine blood, but I, I need to look up the details and I can follow up with you separately to see if what I'm remembering is true. The go-to test for dogs is a serologic test. For example, at Texas Vet Med Diagnostic Lab here, they offer an IFA, indirect fluorescent antibody test, on a fee-for-service basis. This is very useful to detect exposure and, we assume, current infection of the dog over a long time window. Um, when we're testing animal blood using PCR, 
Um, there we're looking for, you know, evidence of the parasite itself. So we would need to interpret our results in light of what do we know of the duration of parasitemia, you know, in an infected host, how likely is it that the parasite is still in the blood? And that might um, help us interpret what a negative means. A negative PCR result might not mean that the host is not infected, if I said that correctly. So I can follow up with you about the fee-for-service labs, um, and then for research purposes, perhaps there's a way that we could, um, our, our research lab might be able to help. That would, that would be terrific. One of the limitations that we've seen with the serology is some of these animals have been, have been living in areas that are endemic for both leishmania and trypanosoma, and sure. serologies cross-react. Absolutely, right. So TVMDL, for example, the diagnostic lab here, also has a leishmania IFA, and in an ideal world, we could run both side by side and look for the stronger reaction. There are a number of um, rapid immunochro immunochromatographic tests that are becoming available for research purposes. These were designed for humans. We're now starting to use them for dogs and other species as we can validate the tests. They're not available to make a diagnosis or, you know, um, commercially. Um, but the nice thing is at least uh, they have been tested with human samples and are not cross-reactive with leishmania. Oh, well, that's cool. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hamer. J uh, Jill, do we have any other questions on the phone? Our next question is from Jen Brown with Indiana State Department of Health. Your line is open, ma'am. Hi, my question is for Dr. Fate. Uh, I know you mentioned that uh, the American Animal Hospital Association, or AHA, was one of the partners that, um, that worked on the definition of antimicrobial stewardship and, and some of the strategic goals. Um, do you know if AHA is planning to include antimicrobial stewardship activities in its requirements for practice accreditation? That's a great question. Um, I know that the, um, the, our current AHA representative on the committee is very interested in, in figuring out how, exactly how to do that. And so I'm, I'm not sure exactly of the status um, of that uh, approach, of, but, but I think that's something that, that the AVMA at least would like to see, whether it's necessarily a part of accreditation, but certainly a part of AHA's educational efforts is, is um, incorporating those activities into hospital management. So um, Erin Fry is the AHA representative, and um, she is working with a subgroup, a subcommittee of the Committee on Antimicrobials right now, actually um, trying to create some um, checklists and some implementation sort of um, tools like templates that would allow hospitals to sort of more easily actually apply these principles into practice. And so whether that will end up actually in AHA accreditation documents, um, I mean, from my perspective, that would be great, um, but, but I'm not familiar enough with those um, procedures to know how likely that would be. But I think that, that, that makes a lot of sense to me in terms of incorporating antimicrobial stewardship in everything um, that you do in a hospital. So that's a great question. Thank you. Thanks, that's really exciting. Great, uh, Jill, do we have uh, one more question? Any more? Yes, we have a follow-up question. I'd just like to remind participants to please press star one and record your name and affiliation. We have a follow-up from Megan Nichols with CDC. Your line is reopened, ma'am. Hi, this question is for Dr. Fate. Thank you so much for um, coming on to present this work. I was wondering, in your experience working on this committee and talking with practitioners and um, the House of Delegates, I was just wondering, what do you hear as some of the barriers or challenges to implementing stewardship in the veterinary profession? Thanks, Megan. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I, I think, I mean, I think there, there are a number of um, sort of categories of barriers. Um, I think one is the how do I actually do this, and that was you know related to the the question right before, which is um, you know what it, in my in my particular setting well, this, these are all great ideas, but what do I actually do like on a day to day basis with a client or before a client comes in or with a producer? What do I actually do? And so that's something that that we're trying to wrap our um, hands around because there are different things in different species that, that become important. 
Um, I think from a um, sort of a One Health perspective, I think there's still some resistance in some pockets of the veterinary profession um, about what, what our role is as veterinarians in, um, in antimicrobial stewardship. Um, and this is not based on conversations that, you know, at the House of Delegates level, it's more, um, you know, on an individual veterinarian level um, or things I hear at various places. And I think um, uh, why, why, is, why is this important enough that um, shouldn't, shouldn't other people be worried about this? I do the best I can. I make good decisions um, and so on. I think there's also, from my perspective, I'm a pharmacologist and I teach pharmacology to veterinary students and also in continuing education. And um, antibiotics are complicated. Um, and so I think there's a trying to figure out how to, how to create educational materials just about the, the understanding of how they work, how you make good choices about them, how you interpret susceptibility test results, how you apply them in their practice. Um, I think there are some, um, it's, not, it's not a simple, you know, one, two, three um, approach to making decisions, medical decisions. And so I think there's some complicated issues related to how do we, how do we help um, educate or re-educate um, about making good decisions about when or when not to use antimicrobials. And then I think there's also inherent in that a little bit is the, um, the idea that as an individual veterinarian with an individual patient, um, my professional judgment um, becomes very important in terms of making decisions. Um, and the feeling that um, if there are too many guidance documents and guidelines and um, you know principles and whatever that that um, that I that that it becomes difficult for me to feel like I'm making a professional decision um, and using my you know what, what I was trained to do. So there's a little bit of that underlying um, some of this, I think. So that's not a very well structured answer, but but it's a great question, I think, and it's something the committee definitely needs to be um, thinking about. And you know, we do some um, is you know what are the we have all these great ideas, but can we really, what can we, what can we do and how, how will it actually play out in real veterinary practice? Okay. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks for all those questions and thanks again to all of today's speakers for their excellent presentations. Uh, a recording of today's call will be posted online at www.cdc.gov slash onehealth slash SOHU. To receive free continuing education for today's webcast, WC2962-030718, complete the evaluation at www.cdc.gov slash TCE online by May the 7th, 2018. And I've got the information there for the web on demand, which is uh, for once the recording is available, which we hope will be uh, by before the next call and detailed instructions for CE are available on our website at cdc.gov slash onehealth slash SOHU slash continuing education. And finally, we'd just like to uh, invite you to please in join us on May 1st uh, at 2 o'clock Eastern time for our next call. And more information is available on our website. Please send suggestions for other um, presenters, any questions you may have about logistics or anything um, related to Zohu Call, and just email us at zohucall at cdc.gov. Thanks again for your participation. Goodbye. That does conclude today's conference call. We thank you all for participating. You may now disconnect and have a great rest of your day. Speakers, please stand by for post-conference.